Hey guys, Rob here with Spirit and Truth. Thank you so much for tuning into this sermon. I hope it speaks to you and that God can speak through you to others. I pray it blesses your life in spirit and truth. If you have any questions or prayer requests, please email us at info at spiritandtruthinternational.org. Again, that's info at spiritandtruthinternational.org. Enjoy the sermon. How you doing, guys? Good. Good to see you. Uh, if we haven't met, I'm Paul. Um, normally on the weekends, I hang out at a church down in Arvada, but uh, I get to be here uh, this weekend. I was here a few weeks ago as well. Um, and if you didn't hear the story, I met Rob, uh, gosh, a long time ago. He was less facial haired at that point uh, when he was a freshman in high school, but uh, just as fiery and, uh, and he's gained a little wisdom and it's been really, really cool to watch. And I'm excited to be here again this morning uh, and share with you, you know, Rob gave me, um, I think in some ways, maybe the, the softball of the series. Uh, he said, hey, can you come preach one of our doctrine messages, and then he gave me the Jesus one. So I think uh, I think we should be in good shape today, but we're talking about doctrine. I don't know if you in your life have ever been a boy. It looks like maybe about half of you have. Um, and, uh, and I don't know if you know this about boys and about men, but sometimes we have terrible ideas uh, like, hey, there's a ramp and I'm on a bike. Let's just go as fast as we can and just see what happens. And then in the air you go, what's below me? Um, Things like that, you know, like, hey, there's a street, there's cars, I have a mud ball in my hand, let's throw this, and we don't think about it after that. And, and one of the things you learn as a boy, usually the hard way, is that ideas have consequences. The things that fly into your brain actually matter in the world, and I think we've seen this through history, right? Good ideas have really great consequences, and bad ideas have some terrible consequences, and not to get too serious right up front, but we've seen ideas like the idea that certain groups of people because of the color of their skin or the language they speak or where they come from are less valuable than other people, right? We've seen the dangerous results and consequences of that idea just as one example. And so the ideas we have in our minds, the things that we think about, the way that we believe actually has huge, massive consequences. I love that you guys are starting kind of building the foundation of who you're going to be as a community of believers with this series called Doctrine, because doctrine is just our ideas about God, about the Bible, about what's true, okay? So we're going to go through just nine big ideas that are right in front of you as a church uh, that Rob and Micah have put together as your doctrinal statement about Christ, about Jesus, about what we actually believe about him. But we're not just going to dive into what those ideas are because those are all written out for you. You can go read all the verses. You can go uh, study into that on your own. You can read books all about it. But we're also going to ask the question, hey, what are the consequences of these particular things about Jesus for me in my life? Because the Bible makes this claim that Jesus was not just the greatest human who ever lived. Jesus was God living a human life, intersecting with our world, being born as one of us, showing us what the perfect human life would look like. And so our ideas about him matter in a huge, huge way for a lot of reasons, because they tell us what our salvation is. They also tell us who we are supposed to be, and they tell us what foundation to build our entire life on, okay? So we're going to start with the doctrinal statement. This is straight off your website, okay? Um, and, and the title today is Jesus Is, and we're going to talk about all the things that Jesus is, but the second half of the title is So What? So what? What does that mean for my life? Okay, so I'm going to read this. You can follow along. It's up on both screens. You can take a look at it. And all these verses, we're not going to go through all of these, but these are all the references from the Bible where you can go check this stuff out and make sure for yourself. And I would encourage you always to do that. No matter who you're listening to, whether it's in church or anywhere else, you always go check it out for yourself. Okay, that's what the Bible tells you to do. That's what every good teacher tells you to do. And so you can go look through all of these verses and see from prophecy to birth to all of the claims about Jesus after he left and went back up to heaven, what we actually as believers, and if you're checking this out and you're not sure about Jesus, you're not sure about Christianity, this is a great day for you to be here because this is the very basics about what I think is the most important thing that we believe. Okay, so 
we believe, this is the statement of Spirit and Truth Church and of Christians worldwide generally, from Pakistan to India to Africa to right here in Fort Collins, okay? We believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That just means that he was God, that he is fully God and fully man. Furthermore, we believe in his virgin birth, sinless life, miracles, propitiating and atoning death. Those are big theological words, okay? Propitiation just means that he came in our place and represented us and took our place. And atonement means that he paid for the things that we couldn't pay for. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, through his shed blood on the cross, if you've ever wondered, not understood this whole Easter and Good Friday and Palm Sunday thing that we're going through right now, this is, again, a great day for you to be here because why Jesus came was to die in our place, okay? In his bodily resurrection, in his ascension to the right hand of the Father, and his personal return in power and glory. So that is in a really packed nutshell what Christianity says and what the Bible says about Jesus. But we're asking the question, so what? So what? There's nine things in here, actually, that are core truths about Jesus, Okay, And one of the things that you will see today as we go through this is that Jesus is not just a guy who lived a long time ago, but he is the person, the God who desires to meet every single need in each and every one of our lives. Okay, And the breadth of what is in that statement and what we believe about Jesus for your life is why we as believers can say, I'm going to spend the very rest of my life and into all eternity knowing and learning more and more and more about Jesus. And I will never get bored. I will never get tired of it. And I will never get to the end of finding out who he is. Okay. And so as we go through this, I want, I want to sort of climb a ladder. There's this natural ladder that the book of Proverbs gives us of how we know we've understood something. Okay, so this is sort of for free as you sort of process, what does it mean to grow? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? And how do I become more and more like him? Okay, so the base level is knowledge. The base level is just understanding the facts of what was just up there, that that is true about God and about Jesus. Okay, but beyond that, then it's the level of understanding. Okay, the level of understanding is when you are beginning to really incorporate it into your life, into who you are, where in Romans 12, we're talking about how we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, right? So our ideas begin to become our own, and it's not just something we see up on a screen or read in a book, but we begin to understand all of the intricacies of it. But the third level that Proverbs gives us is wisdom. And wisdom is when it begins to be infused into my life, and I am acting and behaving differently because of the knowledge that I've gained. And that's where we're going to land today, is we're going to say, hey, do you not only know who Jesus is, do you not only understand the significance of what he did, but has it changed your life? Has it made you a different kind of person who day after day after day is looking more and more like him? Okay? So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to run through nine, these nine facts about Jesus, and we're going to ask these questions of, hey, have I wrestled this down? Have I gone from knowledge to understanding and to wisdom about this particular thing, about the core of who I am as a believer? All right, so God, we, we trust you, and we open our minds and our hearts and our lives to you this morning, and we ask that you would do work today to build in us a foundation of truth. You say that you are a God of truth, and so we never need to fear asking questions or doubting or wrestling or struggling because you are trustworthy and you have said that you are. So as we push against you today, as we question some things today, as we wrestle through what this means for our own lives today, we ask for your guidance and your grace. We pray for Micah and Nate and all of the people involved in what they are still doing. We pray for great fruit this morning. We pray for next week around the world that, that this year, this Easter Sunday, would be a great explosion of people coming to know you for the first time and being reminded of the hope that we have that is worldwide. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so nine realities about Jesus and why they matter is what we're going to go through today. So, so the first one is this, Jesus is God, so he's powerful enough to save me. Okay, Jesus is God, which means that he's powerful enough to save me. See, if I come to you and I'm like, hey, I think you're really great and you look like you're in trouble and I know you've sinned and you've made mistakes and you've done some things wrong and so I'm going to like go die and you're going to be all good after that. What's your response? <laughs> Thanks, bro, but 
Who are you? Like, we haven't even met. I don't know. What, who, right? So when Jesus, this was actually the big question of Jesus' life. When Jesus walks around and he starts forgiving sins and he starts healing people and he ta- starts talking about being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the people who didn't believe in him were like, hey, that's blasphemy. Well, it's only blasphemy if it's not true. Okay? Which is why people like Nicodemus who understood that and then came to the realization of, oh my goodness, this guy's for real. He really is who he says he is. Those are the people who went and changed the world. Okay, People like the Apostle Paul, who at first was trying to kill the Christians, trying to wipe the church off the face of the planet because he thought it was the biggest lie that ever been told, that they were following a man who had said he was God. But then Paul had this encounter where he came to the realization that all of the prophecies had been pointing to this one guy, and he goes, oh my goodness, I'm running as fast as I can in the wrong direction. And he's the kind of guy that has so much fire inside of him that he just turns around after running to the brick wall, and he runs the rest of his life 100 miles an hour in the other direction. And every conversation he has, he goes, listen, he was right. He was telling the truth. And this matters so much because no matter how great of a guy he was, if Jesus was not God and you trust him, you're going to end up in hell. Because he does not have the power to pull you up. He can die for your sins. He can say he's dying for your sins all day long. But at the end of the day, he doesn't have the ability to do anything for you if he's just a good guy. So we believe that Jesus is God, so he's powerful enough to save me. The question is, will I receive it? Will I receive it? Will I stand with nothing in my hands? Will I fall to my knees before him? Will I come with nothing and go, hey, you did everything, I did nothing. You said it's a gift, I'm gonna trust you that it's a gift, and I'm gonna go, hey, I'm in. I receive it, just like Christmas morning. You didn't pay for it. You didn't earn it. You didn't do anything to get it. All you do is you say yes. Okay? Because my great need is rescue. And if you've never come to the point where you've admitted that you need rescue, then you haven't even gotten started. And so this is maybe going to be a little weird. It feels a little early to do this. Normally we would do this all the way at the end, but I'm going to come right out the gate and give you the opportunity to say yes to that right now. Okay, so we're going to pause for a second. Would you do me a favor? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And you can do this if you're watching online right now or later. Okay, but the offer that Jesus makes us is, as God, I am coming to you, making you a promise that if you receive in faith the gift of salvation, that you will be forgiven forever. Your sins will be wiped away and you will go to heaven someday, you will become God's child. So if you've never done that, you've never understood that, but that made sense to you right now, you can pray a prayer, something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. I've made mistakes, but I believe that Jesus died for me. And I'm saying yes and receiving that free gift of salvation right now. If that was you, and for the first time you did that, it's a private moment. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'd just love to know it so I can pray for you later at the end. Would you just slip your hand up? for a second and let me know that you made that decision today for the first time. Slip it up for a second, put it right back down. Well, thank you. You guys can go ahead and open your eyes, but that is the crucial decision of your life. And it's based on the fact that Jesus actually was who he said he was and he proved it. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But the second thing is this, okay? This is the other side of that. Jesus is human, so he's close enough to understand me. He's human, so he's close enough to understand me. And when it comes to forgiveness, there's actually two things we need. Okay, this is why an angel couldn't die for our sins. We need the authority to forgive our sins, which comes from the fact that Jesus is God. We also need someone who can represent us. Okay, which is why an animal was actually never doing it. They were doing all this animal sacrifice thing in the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews makes this really clear. We don't have time to get into it, but you can go read it. But the bulls and the goats and the sheep and all of that, it was never actually forgiving sins. It was getting them ready for when Jesus would show up and say, hey, this is what it was about from the very beginning so that you would understand the system. But we need someone like us to represent us. So it's not just God that died for our sins. It's your big brother, Jesus. He represents you. He's one of you. And he has also been through the things that you have been through. See, because my great need is counsel. 
I need someone like me who's been where I am. And it's no mistake that Jesus spent 90% of his life living a very ordinary human life. Working construction, taking care of his family, being the guy down the street who I call if my kid kicks a hole in the wall of my house. That's who Jesus was for most people for most of his life. And so you need to answer this question. Will I open up to him? Will I trust him? Will I let him see the truth about who I am? Sometimes we hide our hearts from Jesus because we don't think he's enough like us that he would get it. And so Jesus is, he's God, he's man, he's both together. And, and you know, the greatest analogy I think recently for us that I just love coming back to when I think about this is, is the Obama girls growing up in the White House who had a dad who was the president of the United States. He was the most powerful man in the world, but he was also the guy who helped them with algebra. And that's the kind of experience we have multiplied by 10 million with God, where he is the one who made the stars. And he's also the one who really does care if we got a bad haircut and we're bummed about it. And it's this posture that we see from David in Psalm 8 where he says, you are the one who made the moon and the stars. And when I think of the work of your fingers, who am I that you are mindful of me? And yet, you have made me just a little lower than the angels. It's both. Okay, so we serve a God who is powerful enough to save me. I serve a God who is so human, he's close enough to understand me. And then thirdly, Jesus was virgin born, so following him requires faith. Now, this may seem a little goofy to you, but... But as we talk about the virgin birth, it's one of those things in the Bible that we actually, for the most part, take on faith. Now, it was prophesied, but it's not like the resurrection. When you're talking about the resurrection, you go to 1 Corinthians 15, you have this list of names of people who saw him. It's a historical event you can verify. And the truth is, that's the foundation. That's where we start. There is this rational, logical foundation that Jesus gives us over and over and over again. He says, listen, if you're unsure, go to the facts, go to the history, but there are times there are times where we have to go, you know what, I'm not sure. When we're in an airport, hanging out with Tom Hanks, stuck in the terminal because there's no country we can go to and we have to go, God, what am I doing? I don't know. And then all of a sudden we're in a room with a bunch of Iranian Bibles and somebody goes, wow, we needed two more people. See, the virgin birth is this place in Scripture. I would never start there with a skeptic. If I was at Starbucks with somebody who's like, I'm not sure about Christianity. I've got all these questions. I'm never going to go, hey, well, Jesus was born of a virgin, right? Because I can't back that up. That's something I take on faith. There are other places, but we are given these places where we don't necessarily have a historical backing for it. And God goes, hey, listen, I've given you so much other stuff that has led you to this place where your trust in me is on such solid ground, but there has to come a point where you go, you know what, I can't see it, I can't test it, I can't verify it, and my uber skeptical question everything mindset actually has to settle down a little bit today. And so there is a place where following Jesus does require faith. Okay, and the question for you is, will I try before I can trust? Will I try before I'm sure I can trust? Because some of us want to question so long and be so sure that we will never experience what Peter experienced when he was the first one to look out and see Jesus and go, I think that's him, but I'm not sure, and I might die right now. But I'm going to step out. And he's the guy who got to walk on water. And so there are times to step out. And to walk on water because there is a great need in my life to risk. I don't know if you know that about yourself. But if you're not risking in any area of your life, you're dying. And Jesus meets your need for risk. Okay? And then the fourth thing we see about Jesus is that Jesus was sinless. So he actually knows the depths of temptation. I love this observation that C.S. Lewis made. Okay? 
Uh, C.S. Lewis said, we, we tend to think that the person who knows temptation best is the person who's given in to temptation most. But actually, that person only faced temptation for a very short amount of time. And C.S. Lewis makes the point that the person who knows the depths of temptation best is the person who's resisted and who's resisted and who's resisted and who's resisted. So who knows temptation most of all? The person who's never given into it. And he can be with you in your greatest areas of temptation. He can pick you back up after you give in and he can say, I've been farther than that. I've been farther than that. I've lasted longer than that in this temptation that you're facing right now. So you have to ask, will I join him in the fight? Will I join him and, and at least try to go as far as he did in the fight against my own temptation? Because I need guidance. I need counsel. I need a mentor. I need someone who's gone before me to say, uh-uh, you're not done yet. I'm over here. I'm two steps ahead. I'm still ahead. I'm still ahead. No matter how far you go, you will always have someone who's been there and more in every area of your life. And then fifth, Jesus did miracles. See, this is the other side of what we were just talking about. Jesus did miracles, so my faith should not be blind. See, even on the last night of his life, this Thursday probably is the night that this happened, the last supper when Jesus was last with his disciples. And even that night, after three years with him, Philip is going, I'm not sure I get it. And Jesus says, listen, if you're not sure, at least go back to the miracles. Remember the things that you saw. Remember the things that I did. Remember the times when I spoke and someone miles away came back to life. See, my faith is not supposed to be blind. There is a rock solid basis. And this is the gift that God gives us to be able to discern. Should we be Muslims? Should we be Hindus? Should we be new age? Should we kind of blend it all and try to figure it out ourselves? God gives us guidance. He gives us minds to think and to understand, to be able to go, hey, I'm not afraid to take the Quran and take the Bhagavad Gita and take the Book of Mormon and take whatever else and, and sit it all out there and go, if I were God, I would want me to know and so I'm just going to ask, what is the most reliable, trustworthy source? Okay, so Jesus did miracles and he himself said, when you are struggling and you're unsure, go back to the things you know and can verify. Ours is, ours is a historical faith based on a man who was born, who lived, who died, and who was raised from the dead and you can prove it. Which is why if I'm at that table with a skeptic, I am going to start with the resurrection. I'm going to say, listen, I could, we could argue all day long about whether or not creation happened in six days. We could argue all day long about creation versus evolution. We could argue all day long about knowing the ark and whether all the animals would have fit or whatever else. Okay, we could spend years talking about that and uh, bring it on. Let's do it. Okay, but here's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with saying, hey, a man rose from the dead. He said he was God. He said he was going to do it. It was prophesied thousands of years ahead of time, and then he pulled it off. Prove to me that that didn't happen because every honest, good historian who's ever researched it came to that conclusion. Right. Let's start there. And that's what Paul said to do in 1 Corinthians 15. So I'm going to stand on that and I'm going to go, listen, if I get to heaven and find out I'm wrong about how long it took God to create the world or whether Adam and Eve were actually real people or whatever, I'm going to go, cool, <laughs> whatever. Not that it doesn't matter, but the bedrock of my faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the question is, will I search for truth? Will I honestly search for truth? Because when you do, you will find him and you will find him faithful. See, I have this need for a rationale, for trustworthiness, for the ability to know. And some of you guys need that less maybe than I do. But I think all of us need to a degree the ability to go, no, I know. I know what I believe. And then sixth, Jesus died on the cross, so my sins are erased forever. It's what he came to do. It's what he accomplished. It's what we're going to remember on Good Friday this week. And he said, when, when that was all said and done, right before he died, he said this beautiful word to telestah. It means it is finished in our English Bibles is the way it's translated. It's this accounting 
term. It means the debt that you had is paid in full. It's gone. It's erased completely, and it can never be held against you again. See, when criminals would commit a crime and they would go to prison, they would give them a certificate of debt. We still talk about uh, paying our debt to society. And that certificate would be on file with the jailer. Okay? And there's this cool background in the story of the Philippian jailer in, in the book of Acts, which is the background of the whole book of Philippians, but we don't have time to get into all of that. You can go back and read it, but the jailer was responsible for the, for the crimes of the people if he let them go. That's why the guy was trying to kill himself, but they would get a certificate of debt. And when that certificate had been paid, say you were going to be in jail for three months or six months or nine years or whatever, when that was paid, they would take your certificate and they would write across it to tell us, it's paid in full, it's done with, and you would keep that with you because then if anyone ever came back to you to accuse you, you could show them, uh-uh, it's to tell us, it's done, it's paid in full. It's done with. And in Colossians, Paul tells us that Jesus, see, the law comes against us. The law is a mirror to show us the truth about ourselves, that we've sinned, that we've broken God's law, that we are not who we are supposed to be. And so the law constantly stands in judgment against us. That's its job, okay? It did its job very, very well. It still does. But it says that Jesus took the curse that came from that, that certificate of debt, and he wrote across it to Telesta, and he nailed it to the cross for everyone to see. A public display, shaming the accusations that came against us. And that is the very word that Jesus said as he was dying on the cross to tell us that it is paid in full, it is finished, it's done. Never again can those accusations be brought against you. Now, how many of your sins, when that happened, when he said that word, how many of your sins were still in the future? Unless you're real old and don't look it. All of them. So can God, based on the cross, forgive future sin? Of course he can And everything you've ever done, everything you're doing now, everything you will do in the future is gone the moment you say yes to that gift, period. It's like this. This is the way Paul explains it in Romans. He says you you have this massive debt at the bank, $6 million, and you're trying to make your payments, right, on your student loans or whatever it is, and you just can't catch up. You're not even paying the interest. And one day you go in to make your payment because you're just killing yourself. You're working three jobs. You're trying to pay it off and you're not even making a dent. You go in to make the payment. You give them your $236 or whatever it is. And they go, sorry, we can't take that. What are you talking about? Last night, someone came here and they looked for your account. They talked to us about you. And they said, hey, listen, switch our accounts. Put my name on hers and put her name on mine. And so they say to you, that account is closed. And not only is your debt gone, but you have, here's your balance. And they hand you a paper that says you've got $12 billion in your account. And because you feel bad, because you want to do something to participate, you go, wait, yeah, but, but what about my $236? I need to help. You know what their response is? There's no account to put it in. There's nowhere to put it. We couldn't take it if we wanted to. That's what the cross is. That's what Paul tells us. That's what the entire book of Romans is about. So Jesus died on the cross. My sins are erased forever. So here's the question. If that's true, will I give up my shame? Will I stop arguing with Jesus about the truth about whether or not my sins are forgiven? Will I stop letting the sins of the past weigh down on me so that I just repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat all of the stupid stuff that I used to do because of the way I see myself because I have disagreed with him about who I am? Or will I leave the bank and go, I don't know why and I don't know who, but I'm going to do something great with this money. And then number seven, Jesus rose from the dead so I can live every day with hope. Jesus rose from the dead so I can live every single day with hope. Because what do we need most? More than anything else in the world, we need hope, right? 
We need hope that he didn't just die for me, but he rose again to show me that I can have a different life, that he has the power to do everything that he said he was going to do. I can test it. I can verify it. I can question it. I can doubt it, but I can't disprove it. So the question is, will I rise above despair? Or will I keep living my life like Jesus is still in the grave? And then number eight, I love this. What is he doing now? As if all of this so far wasn't enough, right? I mean, as if he couldn't have just phoned it in and been like, That's, I'm good. But what is he doing now? Jesus ascended to heaven where he talks with the Father about me and about you. That's what the Bible tells us he's doing. That's how he spends his days. You know, back when I was coaching high school baseball, on game days when we had a game on Saturday, we'd go to this uh, little local breakfast shop that's unfortunately not there, there anymore down in Arvada, but all the coaches would go and we'd get breakfast. And you know what we talk about? We talk about how are we going to help our boys succeed today? How are we going to help them be the best they can possibly be? We were the coaches. We could have been shooting the breeze, talking about work, talking about family, talking about anything. But we chose to spend that time plotting <laughs> the success of our players. And the coaches that I'm with now for my son's team, you know what we talk about more than anything else? How do we help these boys? How do we help them be better baseball players and better men? See, that's what God spends his time on now. How do I get them to understand that they're my kids and I love them? How do I get them to understand that, yeah, maybe it's not going exactly the way they thought it was going to go and they're having to make kind of pivot and make some different decisions. And yeah, maybe the world's crazy right now. Maybe they don't know what to think about politics or about whatever else. How do I get them to see it? That's what they're talking about. And yet we still have this weird thing. Maybe it's because of the jacked up way we talk to kids sometimes. About like, would you watch that TV show if Jesus was looking over your shoulder? And he's this guy who like stands above us and every time we mess up, he goes, stop it. If that's your view of God, I hope this helps. Okay? But the reality is what God is spending his time doing is talking about you and how to give you purpose. What's next in your life? How to wake you up to things that are more than what you're experiencing right now. That's why he left. He even said that. He said, listen, if I stick around, you're going to show up every morning and go, hey, Jesus, what are we doing today? But instead, he left, and the world exploded. And within 500 years, almost everyone on the planet knew the name of Jesus. Weirdest, most backwards, greatest marketing strategy in history. Yeah. <laughs> Leave, do nothing. Let the world turn upside down, okay? Pretty great. Um, and then nine, Jesus will return someday to take me home. Because I don't know if you know this. I don't know if anybody's told you lately you're not home. I can't tell you how many times in my life that has been such a great comfort. I'm not home. I'm not supposed to feel like I'm at home. Someday I will be, but I'm not there yet. And so when I feel like an alien, when I feel alone, when I don't get it, when people die too soon, when there are accidents, when things aren't working, when I'm confused, I'm reminded of what Peter said over and over and over again. You're an alien. That's why you feel like one. You don't fit here because you are not supposed to, because you were made for another place. And someday he's going to come back. Could be today. I might not even finish this. Could be a thousand years. See, the, the actual doctrine, let's talk about doctrine for a second. The doctrine is called the doctrine of imminence. Okay? If I'm walking on this carpet line right here between the tile and the carpet, and, and imagine it stretches out that way for miles and miles and miles, I can walk for a hundred miles and I'm always one step away from stepping onto the tile. That's actually what the doctrine of imminence is. So when you ask the question, when is the return of Jesus? When's he coming back? 
It's imminent. He could come right now before I finish this word, or he could wait 10,000 more years. And your life needs to be lived in such a way that if he comes now, you go, I have no regrets. And if he comes in a thousand years, you go, I have no regrets. That's the way the apostles lived. That's the way the early church lived. That's the way we should be living. And the question is, will he find me faithful? Will he find me faithful? Because my great need in life, maybe more than anything else, is the need of purpose. So here's the bottom line. The bottom line is this. In every way and in every area of my life, Jesus not only proves trustworthy, but meets every real need I have. I mean, think about how many different things. I know this was a sprint. Think about how many different areas of your life we just saw. Jesus meets you exactly where you need it most. There has never been and there will never be anyone more supremely worth following and devoting myself to than him. He is a living definition of the word glory. That word glory means weight. It means substance. It means being the kind of person that anyone and everyone can respect. That is who Jesus is. And I want to close with something that some of you maybe have heard if you're a cheater and you came down to Arvada for eight hours with Jesus. (laughs) But we talked about the return of Christ. And just the other night at my house, we did this Seder dinner for Passover and kind of went through some of the prophetic stuff and ate stuff that didn't taste good and then some other stuff that tasted really good and talked about, you know, freedom from slavery and all this other stuff, right, that's in the Passover Seder. But one of the things I was reminded of is that Jesus said he's not going to eat a celebratory meal like that again until we are there with him. But the big question is what's he actually going to do that day? You know, if you know about the story the Bible tells about Jesus coming back, you know that he tells this story about a wedding banquet that when we're finally all together with him, there's this huge celebration, a table miles and miles long and foods like in that movie Hook where they, you know, <laughs> they, they imagine it and all of a sudden they're having the food fight and the food just appears. I figure it's kind of like that. Okay, but there's food for miles and miles and miles, things you've never tasted, never even heard of, never seen. But the question that Jesus answers and you maybe have never seen is where is he? Because if we picture the scene, like the weddings that we go to where you have this big massive feast, he presents himself as the groom, right? As the person who's being celebrated as the the head of the whole thing. And so we assume that there's this massive table in this glittering hall in this giant castle and they're probably miles and miles and miles away from me because we got to make room for all of these heroes, which by the way, are probably the grandmas who prayed in a closet for years and years and years and years and years. They're the ones way up there. and Me and Rob and Micah and all these people that get to have microphones on our heads once in a while are probably way down this way. And I'm so grateful for that reminder that that's how it'll be. But, But what we picture is we picture way up there, maybe I can just catch a glimpse of him as Jesus at the head of the table people bowing to him, celebrating him, and serving him. But what he said is that's not where he is at that banquet. What he said in Luke 12, 37 is that you will be there. If you've placed your faith in him, you will be there. You will be seated at your seat with your food in front of you in this massive banquet laid out. And up from behind you will walk this man. Simple, ordinary man that you wouldn't even pick out of a crowd. Dressed in ordinary clothes. Who will say to you, hey, can I have your cup? And when you hand it to him, he'll fill it with water and hand it back. And when you turn him. See, Jesus himself said that on that day, the greatest day of victory in his existence, he will get up from the table just like he did in John 13. He will dress himself 
to serve. And he will make sure that you get to eat. That's what glory is. I don't know about you, but I have never known a person in my life who comes anywhere close to that. That's my Jesus. And he is worth following for the rest of your life. 